This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have, and all the blessings of Abraham are mine. I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I am taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. May be seated. And today we're going to be in 1 Kings 17, but if you would, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 4. Say this, say, God will do whatever I believe He will do. Say, God will do whatever I say He will do. And of course, that's on the basis of His Word. We've been learning how you can write your own ticket with God, how you can achieve your dreams and your desires if you have dreams and desires, God, put those there. You can receive what you want from God in any area of life by taking four steps of faith. You got to, number one, say it. Then number two, you must do it. Number three, then you must receive it. And then number four, you must tell it. And you may have sent us a testimony and you might be wondering when we're going to get to it. I've got a whole stack on my desk at home and I'll, I'll probably read a few throughout this week, the offerings and the evening services. We'll get to it, amen. But it, praise God, God is doing great things. We're receiving so many miracles, we can't read them all every week, and now we got a stack, and so we're, don't, let me, don't think though that you don't need to share yours with us because of it. Email it, send it to us, we'll add it to the stack, we'll get to it, because your testimony will inspire someone else. Because what God does in the life of one, he'll do in another. Amen. And somebody might be struggling to believe God in a particular area, and they'll hear your testimony, and faith will rise up in their heart. So share it with us. Positive or negative, you determine your harvest. Positive or negative, you determine what you receive from God. And how is that? It's by what you say and by what you do. Why are people defeated? People are defeated because they don't take God at His word. People are defeated because they don't apply God's word to their life. People are defeated because they don't take action on the word they've already heard. And people are defeated because they choose their relationships, their associations, and their friends in life poorly. Remember what Paul said, bad company corrupts good character. And that is true 100% of the time. Romans 10, 17 has been the launching pad for this series. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing an anointed spoken word. But when you hear it, you not only have to hear it, you gotta take action. You gotta do something. You ought to, gotta obey God. Today and next Sunday, we are going to learn about the missing ingredient that will change your life. The missing ingredient that will change your life. And what is that missing ingredient? I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, it is action. The missing ingredient that will change your life is action. So mark it down, write, write it, highlight it, circle it, put a star next to it. The missing ingredient that will change your life in any area of life is action. What will take you from fa failure to success? Action. What will take you from defeat to victory? Action. What will take you from not enough to more than enough? Action. What will take you from unanswered prayer to answered prayer? Action. What will take you from a, a place in your life where there are no miracles, no answers, to miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle? Action. Action is the missing ingredient. What will resurrect any area of your life? and your hopes, and your dreams, action. Action, action, action. 
taking action on the Word of God. Faith is not just belief or hope. Faith is action. And miracles don't just happen. You know, we're not here this morning. I'm not going to show you a, a Hallmark movie. Get a cup of cocoa, get your pajama pants on, and, well, miracles just happen and just keep believing for a miracle. No, you keep believing for a miracle, you're not going to get a miracle. Miracles require action. And action is the missing ingredient in the lives of many. And then sometimes the problem is we're taking action in this area and in that area and this area over here, but then we've got these other areas of our lives where we're believing God for a miracle, but we're not taking any action. Action is the answer. It's the missing ingredient. Miracles don't just happen. If you want something from God, you will have to do something. You will have to take action. Now in 1 Kings 17, we have the story of a non-Jewish widow who needed a miracle. She, she wasn't a daughter of Abraham. She wasn't a part of the covenant. She wasn't special. She wasn't privileged. She wasn't chosen. And yet in the land during a time of famine, it was a non-Jewish widow who received a miracle. In 1 Kings 17, it was dark days. Ahab had become king. The Bible says of Ahab that he did more evil than all the kings of Israel before him. Then to add to it, he married a woman named Jezebel. You know, guys, here's some dating advice. If her name is Jezebel, you got to find somebody else. <laughs> and what kind of woman was Jezebel? She's the kind of woman the Bible speaks of. She sins, she does great evil, great wickedness, and then she wipes her lips and has the gall to say, I have done nothing wrong. They were evil days dark days, and so God sent his hand of judgment upon the land. Why? So they would repent. And so they were days of famine. Now, before we go to 1 Kings 17, look briefly at Luke chapter 4. Jesus had been baptized in water by John. The Holy Spirit had come upon him. He had fasted 40 days and, night, and nights. He had been tempted by Satan. He had passed the test. Then verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So notice, before he got to his hometown, his ministry went well. They, they heard, they believed, and great things happened. Verse 16, he went to Nazareth, his hometown, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. Verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was, was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and they were looking at him. And then he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And so he knew that even though they had acted polite, he knew what was really going on here. And he knew what was really going on here. And so he said, surely you'll quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard you did at Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. That's where we're about to go, 1 Kings 17. When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Verse 28 is the key. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. You know, we often imagine certain things that when Jesus ministered, everything always went well. 
He, he, he shared what the Holy Spirit had him share that day, and they were furious, they were angry. Verse 29, they got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him down the cliff. Today is the day when we remember Palm Sunday, the day when he rode into Jerusalem on a colt, a donkey that had never been ridden before. Well, why did he, he ride in on a colt? Because that's what they used in Israel. They didn't have Arabian stallions. So he rode in on a colt. They laid palm branches down and they sang Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. They, they worshiped him as king. But within days, the very, the very same people would shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And here on this day, they were so angered at the beginning of his ministry by what he said and by what he shared and by what he pointed out, they tried to get him to the edge of a cliff to throw him off, to kill him, to murder him. Verse 30, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now, why did I have us go there first? Think about it. The widows of Israel were the descendants of Abraham. It was a time of famine, surely. If God wanted to meet anyone's needs, if in the land, in the region, God wanted any woman and her family to be fed, surely it was the descendants of Abraham, the servants of God. And yet, Elijah did not go to any of them. He went to a non-Jewish widow. See, God, he, he, his desire, as Paul wrote Timothy, he wants all men, all people to be saved. In times of famine, God wants everyone's needs to be met. He wants everyone to be provided for. But to receive your miracle, what must you do? You must take action. And action is the missing ingredient in the lives of many. No doubt, in Elijah's day, God spoke to the daughters of Abraham. God spoke to those Jewish widows. If I send a man of God to you, Will you take some of the little that you have and feed him? And if you do that, I will give you a miracle. And what did they say to the Lord? No. 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 If you send the man of God to my house, I will not feed him. I will not take some of the little I have to give him food to eat. I don't have enough for myself. I don't have enough for my children. I will not take some of the little I have to feed them. No, God, no, no, no. Why did they not receive a miracle when this non-Jewish woman, this non-favored woman, this woman who was not of a part of the covenant, she received her miracle? It's because all of those women said no, but there was one woman who said yes. Now look at 1 Kings 17, beginning in verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here and turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. Always remember that God is our source. And God is our supply. David said, I was young and I was old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Well, how's God going to do it? I don't know how he's going to do it, but he will always make sure that his children are taken care of. We just have to cooperate. We just have to obey. We just have to do our part. As we learned last Sunday, we just have to follow instructions. Verse 5 continued. Elijah went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. So we see, as we learned last week, Elijah followed instructions. He took action. We see that. Verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, that is Elijah, go at once to Zarephath the Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. Again, notice, we see action a second time. Notice again, he, he, he followed instructions. 
Well, well Lord, I, I wonder why I haven't received my miracle. I wonder why I'm not blessed at this job. Because I told you to get a different job five years ago. See, the blessed place is obeying God. The blessed place is following His instructions. The blessed place is going where God says go and doing what God says do and being who God says be and doing whatever He says. When He came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called, to eat, he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? Notice, notice this. He, he doesn't say, bring me all your water. Bring me a little. So there, there were women in Israel. God didn't ask for all. He asked for some. No. Bring me a little. So notice that, not all of the water she had, just a little. Bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink. As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. Notice again, he didn't ask for all her food. Give me everything you have left. Wasn't a bank robbery. Wasn't a stick up. A little water, a piece of bread. A little water, a piece of bread a little water, a piece of bread. Yet how many people are there? And they say they love God. They say Jesus is Lord. Next Sunday, everybody will act real religious. But God says, just do this little small thing. No! Just give this little small thing. No! Make this one change in your life. No! See, a lot of times we go to a passage like the rich young ruler. Oh man, that's, that's stout. Jesus told the young man to give away all he had. That is rare, 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 rare. Most of the time, God is just asking somebody to do a little thing, to take some little action, to get some little sin out of their life. And people say, no, no, no. And then they wonder, where their miracle is. They wonder where their blessing is. So bring me a little water, bring me a piece of bread, as surely as the Lord your God lives. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. No, notice how offensive this is. Go ahead and do that. Go ahead and eat your last meal and die. But first, and this is the key, but first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Here's the word from the Lord. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. And so we see right here, step number one from this series, how to write your own ticket with God. Step number one, Elijah said it. He said, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until when? Until this famine is over. Then verse 15, notice, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So we see the second step. She did it. She followed instructions. She took action. And what was the result? So there was food every day for Elijah and for this woman and her family. It was like they had CC's pizza at their house. An endless, unlimited buffet, how? It was a miracle of God. Yet at the very same time, there were people doing without. At the very same time, there were good church folk doing without. At the very same time, there were religious people doing without. What was the ingredient in this woman's life that she had that so many don't? Action, 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 action. She took action. She obeyed. She said yes to God. And you see, you got to have eyes to see it. What, what kind of days are we living in? John Osteen always used to quote where it says that the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking the hearts of those who are fully committed to him. What, what kind of days are we living in? And it's nothing new. We're living in days when there are thousands and there are millions saying, no, no, 
no to God. And if you will be the man or woman who says yes to God, you will be amazed at what God does in your life. It's the missing ingredient. It's the key to everything. It's the key to your miracle. It's the key to what you're believing for. There are many believers and they love God, but they're in desperate need of a miracle. And the missing ingredient is action. You might say, Austin, it can't be that simple. It is. Action is the missing ingredient. Like God told Joshua, you can make your way, your life prosperous and successful. Success comes by obedience to the word of God. Success comes by taking action. God spoke a rhema word to this woman through Elijah. And what did she do? She heard the word. She believed the word and she acted on the word. Success comes by obedience to the word of God. Success comes by taking action. Obedience is how we take action. Obedience is how we receive miracles from God. Learn to trust God to such an extent that you can hear his voice and obey his instructions. I was just in the 9 a.m. service. Worship had ended. I knew that my father would do the greeting. My mom would read those testimonies. I knew what they are. I, I, I read them. I, I prepare them during the week. And I was over there, and the Lord put on my heart for Jessica and I to double up what we're doing in the St. Paul Scholarship Fund. See, train yourself to, to such an extent that you hear his voice and you obey him whenever he speaks to you. And it's not always in church. It could be when you're getting ready tomorrow morning. It could be after you've eaten too much for lunch tomorrow and you're not feeling very spiritual. It'll surprise you when he speaks to you. Partner your life together with something greater than yourself. Partner together with the anointing and the anointed of the Lord. We can do things by the anointing of God and by the power of God that we cannot do any other way. But, but have the eyes of faith to see. See, people think that if they can, they can work themselves into something, the power of God is released. That, it, that if I could just pray long enough, enough hours, if I could just skip enough meals, if I could just, if they play the right song and I could just dance enough, I'll, I'll, I'll work myself into a frenzy where, where the power of God is released. That's not the way it works. The power of God is released when you simply do what God says do. And many times people would say it's not religious or spiritual at all. Basically, she gave this guy a sandwich and the power of God was released. So when you're, you're at lunch and God moves on your heart to buy someone else's meal, you might think, I don't need to do that. You don't know what miracle you're missing. You don't know what God would do in your life if you would obey. When you're at the store and you're walking down an aisle and, and God puts it on your heart maybe to buy shoes for a kid you know needs shoes, you might think, I don't need to do that. You don't know what miracle you're missing out on. When God, God speaks to you and says, tells you to do something for your, your husband or wife, and you think, oh, that's not a big deal. They'll love me anyway. They're not going to divorce me. You don't know what miracle you're missing. The power of God is released when we obey. The power of God is released when we simply do what he says do. In his word, and then when he speaks to us and gives us a rhema word. Number one. When God asks you to give out of your life or to do something or to take some action, it's only because he's preparing to give into your life. When God asks you to give out of your life or to do something or to take some action, it's only because he is preparing to give into your life, to do something wonderful. Like Oral Roberts used to say, something good is about to happen to you. Jessica and I, a week ago, we were at a fundraiser, and typically I don't do that, but it was for St. Paul, so I did it. We were in line, and God moved on my heart to pay for the people behind me. I thought nothing of it. It was $21. The, the very next day, somebody Facebook messaged me $500. I would say it was worth it. <laughs> See, when God moves on your heart to do something or anything, no matter how small or how big it is, a miracle is coming. A blessing is coming. Provision is coming. But if we don't do what he says do, if we don't hear and obey, the miracle doesn't happen. When he asks you to do something, he's preparing to do something wonderful in your life. 
Verse 9, I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Notice that before Elijah said one word to the widow, God had already spoken to her. God had already spoken to her. God had already spoken to her. You know, I've grown up full gospel my whole life. You know, I can out Pentecostal any, anyone. But people can be weird. People can be strange. Well, the Lord spoke to me and told me that I'm supposed to marry. Well, he didn't speak to me. A true word from the Lord is always a word of confirmation. And so, why do people get into weirdness and strangeness and ridiculous words from the Lord? It's all to mask their disobedience. You know, they'll come up to us in the atrium and tell us some ridiculous thing as if the Lord is speaking to them to leave their, their children or their spouse. That ain't the Lord. And many times people blame the devil for things the devil's not even doing. That's you and your selfishness. Notice that this word was a word of confirmation. To receive miracles, you've got to learn to trust God to such an extent you can hear his voice and obey his instructions. Then verse 11, and bring me please a piece of bread. When God wants to bless you with something better, he'll first ask you to give or do something in faith. He, he's not trying to diminish you. He's not trying to decrease you. When we were at Chipotle and God put it on my heart to bless the person behind me online, he wasn't thinking, you know, Austin can do without that $35. I want to see $35 less in Austin's bank account by 5 p.m. today. He's not trying to diminish you. He's not trying to decrease you. He wants to bless you. He wants to multiply you. That's why I know when we say, don't do garage sales. You know, it's ridiculous. If I were president of the United States, my first act would be to get rid of all the storage in our nation and to give everything away. And you're like, no, that's my stuff. Exactly. We would give it away to people who need it. Now they're building storage lockers four and five stories high. Pretty soon there'll be skyscrapers. That is how selfish our nation is. Give it away. He'll bless you with more. Give it away. He'll bless you with better. And whatever you need, that's what you got to sow. Ladies, you want more clothes? Give some clothes away. You want more furniture? Give some furniture away. Whatever you need, sow. She needed to eat, so what did she sow? Food. God doesn't want to diminish you or decrease you. He wants to increase you and multiply you. It's a setup. Tell your neighbor, say, it's a setup. Set Tell your other neighbor, say, it's a setup. He's setting you up for something better. What she had left was a little, but that little was nothing compared to her need. We serve a great God who meets great needs. I said we serve a great God who meets great needs. And not just with enough so the balance zeroes out. He meets great needs with more than enough. Bring me, please, a piece of bread. To you or me it was little, but to her it was all she had. Her need was great. It was a time of famine. The world makes fun of giving, and some Christians make fun of giving too. But I imagine that when the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, she was glad she obeyed. I bet she was glad she took action. I bet she was glad she partnered together with a man of God who carried a prophet's reward. Jesus went to Nazareth, and they dishonored him. He went to Nazareth and they rejected him. And it's in that context that he said, if you honor a prophet as a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. If you honor a righteous man as a righteous man, you'll receive a righteous man's reward. Elijah was anointed. He carried a prophet's reward. The world may mock and make fun of it. Some Christians may even mock and make fun of it. But her great need was met because she heard, she obeyed, she took action. In a time of famine, she gave her last meal, part of, not all of it, part of it in obedience to God. The result, a miracle. The jar of flour was not used up. The jug of oil did not run dry. What was the missing ingredient? What is the missing ingredient in the lives of so many believers? Action, action, action. Your action, your obedience, your giving is the key to your miracle. And it's a small thing next to whatever God wants to do in your life. Notice she had to do something. She had to take action. 
Notice, as Jesus pointed out, and they were so angry they wanted to kill him, murder him. God doesn't respond to need. Well, maybe if my life is messed up enough, I'll get God's attention. He doesn't respond to need. Well, well, Austin, I saw places doing all night prayer for debt canceling. He doesn't respond to need. He responds to faith. And faith is not just belief. Faith is taking action on the word of God. He responds to faith. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. She had to hear the word and believe the word and take action. And the result was life, not death. Provision instead of lack. Number two, God will never diminish your life. He wants to multiply your life. She said, I don't have it. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. That was her vision for her life. We're going to eat one last meal and then we're going to die. In 2019, lift up your eyes and believe God for more. I said, in 2019, lift up your eyes and believe God for more. Partner together with something greater than yourself. Partner together with the anointing and the anointed of the Lord. We can do things by the anointing and by the power of God. We can't do any other way. But remember, the power is released when we obey. The power is released when we do what God says do. He doesn't want to diminish you. He wants to multiply you. And number three, if it doesn't meet your need, it must be your seed. If it doesn't meet your need, it must be your seed. When we were in line and God spoke in my heart to bless someone with whatever their meal cost, 20 something dollars, 30 something dollars, look, that, that is not enough to pay for our children's tuition at St. Paul's. We have great needs. You know, when, I, when Samuel doesn't need diapers and pull-ups anymore, that's going to be a, a miracle on my miracle list. <laughs> people have one child and complain about what stuff costs. There are, there are young married people, they don't have any children complaining about what stuff costs. You need to deal with the real. <laughs> I don't need $35. I need big money to do what we're doing. And so what does God do? He, he, he speaks to you. He gives you homework. He gives you assignments. He, he tells you to be a blessing, not just in church, but during the week when you're out and about. Why? He's trying to line up you up for greater blessings, greater miracles for, the, for what you need for your family. If it doesn't meet your need, it must be your seed. She needed a miracle. She needed a miracle. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 4 and beginning in verse 25. I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, the region of Sidon. When God speaks, he often speaks to many. Why? Because so few obey. If one man doesn't say yes, God will speak to another. If one woman doesn't say yes, God will speak to another. That's why when, when someone says, you know, For whatever reason, we're not coming back. You don't see my dad and I fall down outside the building and cry and set up a tent to have 30 days of penance. Why? Because we don't look to man or woman as our source. Who is our source? See, when God is your source, you don't have to cry. You don't have to beg. And one man says no, one woman says no. God will keep speaking until someone says yes. This woman said yes. Elijah, the man of God, needed to be fed. Why did God send him to a non-Jewish woman? Why did God send him to the widow of Zarephath? Because she was the woman who said yes to God. In your life, you want a breakthrough? In your life, stop telling God no. And start telling God yes. Say yes to God and you will receive your miracle. Say yes to God and you will receive. God supplies seed to who? So who is the person who doesn't sow? They're the person always saying no, 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 no. I want to bless you. Give this, do this, be a blessing, and I'll I'll give you what you need. No, 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 no. Who does he give seed to? 
the sower, the doer, the obeyer. And we shouldn't have a problem with this because he has promised to supply how many of our needs? But you read Philippians chapter 4, and there's some context there. Because Paul was in prison, he was in need, and out of all the churches, there was just one that had been a blessing to him. He says there in Philippians 4, not one church participated with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except who? You, the church at Philippi, except you only. And it was to that church, he said, my God shall supply how many of your needs? See, it's to the church that says yes. It's to the man or woman of God that says yes. So if you'll be someone who says, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, he will supply all of your needs. You got to say, yes, Lord. I love the way Mary, you know, we're going to deal with prayer this week. You don't pray to Mary, but we can learn something from Mary. The angel of the Lord came to Mary and she said unto the angel of the Lord, so be it unto me. What was she saying? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I don't understand it. I don't see how it can be, but so be it unto me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If it doesn't meet the need, it must be the seed. When it's not enough, give it. When it's not enough, sow it. When it's not enough, put it in the hands of God. Jesus had a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children. They were hungry. When people are hungry, they get cranky. That's how I know when it's time to bring the service to an end because you, you can see the look on people's faces. They kind of get hang, hangry, we call it. You know, why are they looking at me like that? It's not because they disagree with the message. They're thinking, land the plane, wrap it up, bring it to an end. I, I got to get the chilies before the Baptists get there. Hangry. A large crowd, 5,000 men, plus women, plus children. You imagine how noisy it was? When, man, when we get our kids food and ice cream and french fries, they're quiet. Julia woke up this morning before Jessica saw her. I just gave her some donuts. Man, that girl wasn't making a, a noise. And like she wasn't even awake yet. She's happy. They needed to feed a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children. And there was a boy. Now, he didn't give some. He gave all. Five loaves and two fish. It was enough for him, but it wasn't enough for the crowd. But he put it into the hands of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He multiplied it. And he turned what was not enough into more than enough. If it's not enough to meet the need, it must be the seed. Put it in the hands of God. Obey God. Take action. Do whatever God has been putting on your heart to do. And watch what God does in your life.